Medicine graduate entry programme at Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. A UCAT using accelerated medical programme with a sensational reputation in the heart of London. What on earth more could you want? In 2022, 1,117 candidates applied to the course, 112 were invited to attend an interview and around 50 offers were given. This gives you a competition ratio of about 1 in 22 from application to enrolling. My name is Marius Hugh and I'm a final year fresh trim at Sa and I'm a final year graduate entry medical student at Southampton and in this series of videos we try to combine a plethora of resources to make the most comprehensive evidence-based video guides for graduate medicine applications in the UK. So the setup for the four year course at Barts is you do one year of a bespoke program and then you hop back into year three of the undergraduate program in your year two. After that you just do the exact same stuff as the undergraduates uh, in their standard year three, four and five. You do a year on your own as a group of grads and then you do the same stuff as the undergrads for the next three years and this is the same setup as they've got at Newcastle but this differs from other graduate medical schools like Oxford and Southampton where we do two years of a graduate only course and then the same stuff as the undergrads in the latter two years so the courses that do two years graduate only before you're reintroduced probably sort out the whole of preclinical medicine so anatomy physiology pharmacology etc before you're reintroduced into the undergraduate cohort but with a one-year graduate only course they can't reasonably sort out the whole of preclinical medicine so um, you'll probably have to you know jump back in with the 19 year olds and learn some uh, pathology etc and because graduate courses typically teach in a PBL style and Bart's is no different to this it's problem-based learning and it's small group learning for the graduates when you're reintroduced in your year two the teaching style probably switches so I would postulate that between years one and two the way, the way that you're going to learn preclinical medicine actually changes so second year for us at Southampton we had preclinical medicine up till um, like Christmas whereupon we took our um, January exams, our sort of final preclinical exams, and then we went on to clinical medicine for the rest of that year. One potential benefit of this setup is the fact that you'll meet the, the undergraduate cohort earlier in your medical school career so that by the time um, you've gone onto your clinical placements you'll probably already have some friends um, in that group which are going to make up the bulk of, of the student body at the school. Yeah, gra graduate courses can be quite small um, and if you decide that you hate the other sort of 40, 45 people on your course, um, then it's not the end of the world because you'll reintroduce more quickly. So onto the problem-based learning, small group stuff, and this I see is a unique selling point for Bart's and something that you should ham up in your interviews. So reading on Google Scholar, it seems like problem-based learning is pretty much exactly the same as case-based learning which we do at Southampton and this is where the medical topics that you're going to learn each week are introduced through the vehicle of a case. So you're given this thing called trigger material at the start of a week and really this could be uh, a number of different things but generally it was just a, a sort of paper-based um, clinical scenario sort of written out. So the story of a fictitious patient is created um, and you learn about how they start experiencing certain symptoms. They go to hospital and they get some blood work done and you review the results of that blood work. They then go and get a scan and you look at the imaging which is also um, packaged up within this case. So you're learning about the disease that they're presenting with and obviously through that the sort of relevant bits of anatomy and physiology and pharmacology etc. But you're also really early getting into introduced to various relevant aspects of clinical medicine. So you learn to interpret the bloods and scan results alongside your learning of the rest of um, the disease process. So really you're building a picture of this patient's journey through a certain disease. So the idea is that this trigger material will trigger your learning of certain aspects of medicine more broadly. So for instance in our neurology week in year two, our case or our trigger material had someone who um, had suddenly developed pain and loss of vision in one eye. Um, you know they got a lumbar puncture and it showed these results oligoclonal bands um, they then went for an MRI which is the relevant scanning and we saw the image um, and it revealed that they had multiple sclerosis so from an anatomy perspective you might learn about sort of the brain and the spinal cord and maybe the cranial nerves as well almost certainly learn about neurophysiology and action potentials and so on and so forth but you'll also learn about relevant aspects of clinical practice like for example sort of how to do a cranial nerve examination so if you've watched any of my videos I I really think this way of learning for adults is so good and it makes you feel early on like you're making good strides towards becoming a doctor rather than just you know that you're back at uni just sitting in lecture theatres learning seemingly irrelevant stuff so it's a very different experience to undergraduate based learning and yeah definitely a few of my colleagues hated it because you could tell because they would just sit in silence for the the case-based learning sessions and you just feel like bruv like get involved you know the constellation of personalities in different groups sometimes doesn't work as well because 
inevitably there's some big egos going into into graduate medicine because you've got to be the cream of the crop. Yeah, definitely at least one group had had drama, but yeah, it's not ideal, but at least it made for some some decent gossip amongst amongst the rest of the cohort, spice things up a bit. So to wrap this up, I think the small group stuff and the PBL stuff is a key, um, unique advantage about Bart's graduate medicine and a reason you might want to go there over places that use lecture-based learning or places that you know clearly segregate their preclinical medicine from clinical medicine. Probably another unique selling point for Bart's graduate medicine is the fact that the way they teach their anatomy is using dissection. So from my research, I haven't come across any other graduate medical school that teaches anatomy through dissection. The rest of them, for example, you know, Southampton and Warwick, they do prosection, which is where everything is pre-dissected out by sort of trained professional anatomists. And then the tissue somehow fixed, whether that be using formaldehyde or plastinating it, which Warwick does. And you go around in your little groups with your graduate medicine colleagues, um, you've got your little notebooks out, um, and you're going around and appreciating the structures that the anatomy teachers want you to appreciate in that particular week. And hopefully the anatomy will be relevant to the trigger material that you read at the start of the week. So dissection is a more traditional way of teaching anatomy where you're assigned a cadaver at the start of the year and in your groups you actually physically uh, are involved in the in the cutting process and in the re revealing of the structures. So the advantages to mention about dissection over prosection are the fact that it's you know it's a more traditional way to learn and it is quite special to imagine that you know you're connecting with the history of your profession and this is how you know people 60 70 years ago were learning anatomy and it's cool to think that you're following in the footsteps of doctors that have gone before you also for those interested in surgery it's a much more hands-on way to learn anatomy in addition i guess because you get a full cadaver um, rather than just sections of different cadavers um, you can potentially appreciate more effectively how different parts fit into the whole. So in terms of background, the last two things to mention are location and hospital affiliations. So Barts is located kind of central to East London. Um, it's affiliated with some really big hospitals like the Royal London, which is a massive trauma center. So all the really intense trauma cases will go there. So that is all the background stuff. Let us move on to the undergraduate requirements. Barts say on their website that you need a minimum of a 2-1 in any subject. Is this reflective of the academic profiles of those who are actually getting into Barts and London graduate medicine. So for this we have to consult the freedom of information requests. So the 2019 Parminder DR request, you know we've got UCAT score on the left hand column and the degree classification on the right. So some quick maths reveals that over these three years 95% of people who've got in have had first class degrees. So what is going on here exactly? So this is a statistical physical manifestation of a particular selection policy and it's this line here which is telling applicants are selected for interview using a weighted score comprising of UCAT and degree. So presumably your UCAT gives you a certain number of points and then your degree classification gives you a certain number of points and the combined total is the score with which you'll be ranked against the rest of the applying cohort in that year. So by this logic to be in with any chance of getting an offer from Bratz with a 2-1 undergraduate degree you're going to need an absolutely wedge score in the UCAT. So this is particularly telling in the 2019-2020 cohort where the lowest score for a first was 2,560 this actually might be an outlier because the next lowest is 2,750, which seems a bit more realistic. However, the lowest UCAT score for someone who got in with a 2-1 was 3,130, which is 782.5. So coming to the most up-to-date statistics at the time of making this video in 2023, we find that in 2022, every single person who applied to Bart's graduate medicine with a 2-1 was rejected pre-interview. And further to this, the lowest UCAT score for someone with a first that got to interview was 2,940. I don't really know how to explain this. Um, there aren't significantly more people applying, so maybe it was just a really competitive year and just bare people had firsts and really high UCAT scores. So off the back of this, obviously my advice would be to really consider strongly if you've got a 2-1, just think about where else you could apply. There's literally no point in applying to a graduate program and getting a pre-interview rejection. Like you've only got four shots per year and you need to maximize the number of interviews that you get to give yourself the best chance of getting an offer. If you've run out of graduate medical programs, just consider applying to undergraduate courses. There's ways to fund them. Um, other people have made videos on that. The worst place you can be in the statistics is in that cohort that has applied and been rejected pre-interview. At Bart's, there's over a thousand people that are rejected pre-interview for this course. 
course just last year. You know, if there's 500 man in there with two ones and sort of reasonably high UCAT scores, but not over 3,000, which I would 100% guess that there are, I would like to see all these men just taking their efforts elsewhere and applying somewhere that they've got a realistic chance of getting in. The other thing to say is if you're at the stage where you're at the moment doing an undergraduate degree and you're considering doing graduate medicine, which a lot of my, a lot of the people that contact me are in that position. If this is you and you really want to go to London for graduate medicine, then you should really try hard to get that first, which obviously I know is, is easier said than done. Like, yeah, I probably tried too hard and got a 68, so. But that said, that first ticket, if you can just get over that 70, it will make your life considerably easier. So since we're on the UCAT, we may as well finish it off. So we've established that the lowest score that you would have needed last year alongside a first was a 2940. If we look at the previous year, we find that the lowest UCAT score for someone that got into BARTS with a first was 2,870, and the lowest UCAT score for someone who got a 2-1 was 3,250. So the burning question on everyone's mind, I know, is how exactly does the situational judgment test factor into the decision-making at BARTS in the London? So from this one, what we can see is that in the cohort who achieved an interview in 2021, um, there was just a real spread of situational judgment test bans. There were even 31 people that copped an interview with a band three or band four. This is definitely a subtest of the UCAT that you can considerably improve in. Like with some deliberate practice, my score went from a band three in first year um, to a band one, obviously in second year. In the situational judgment test that you take at the end of final year, um, I managed to get in the, the top sort of five, five percent of people. So. Just know that if you get a band three in the SJT, it's not a big deal and it probably doesn't reflect how well you're going to do in the SJT at the end of uh, final year. Although I think they're going to scrap that now and you lot are going to be randomly allocated um, around different places in the country. So back to the statistics, what I think that this means is that don't worry if you flop the situational judgment test, just apply to BARTS with a first and a good UCAT score and you'll probably get an interview. So they do say that you can have any subject, but the most reliable way to examine this is by asking the uni, what were the degree titles for those successful in getting an interview last year? So most other unis are compliant with this request in my experience, but for some reason, um, BARTS doesn't want to give us this information. So in the absence of this list, all I can give you is some anecdotal evidence. So my girlfriend got an interview with a 2-1 in an engineering degree. One of my dons from Southampton got an offer with a first in nursing degree. Um, one other guy I know got in with um, a first in natural sciences degree. So anecdotally, there seems to be people getting in with quite a spread of degrees. So make of that what you will. But the last thing to say about degree is the fact that there are different requirements um, in your A-levels based on what degree that you have. So to keep this brief, if you go onto their website and type in your degree title, um, it will tell you what A-levels you need to qualify. So if you don't have the A-level, either take that A-level in the year that you're gonna apply, I know people at Southampton who did um, access courses and things or went and got extra A level so that they could qualify. Either do that or just don't apply to bar. If you've watched this video to now, I don't want to see you in that 1,000 people strong pre-interview rejection cohort. There is no honour in that. I want to see you getting an offer. So apply to other places where there's no A level requirements um, like Southampton and Warwick or consider taking the GAMSAT. Just explore your options more broadly. I'm, I'm not a fan of the free interview rejections. I, having got four the year before, I don't, need, I don't need you to get any more. You don't have to make the same mistakes as I did. So essentially there are three distinct streams of, of requirements here. Certain science degrees you need A-level biology or chemistry depending on what's missing. And finally for non-science degrees, um, you need bio or chemistry and one other science at grade B. But yeah, maybe the true reason that everyone who gets into Barts and the London graduate medicine with a first is the fact that only really smart people can actually decipher these A-level requirements. All right, so we've copped a first in any subject. We've checked our degree against the A-level requirements. We've slapped up the UCAT, and now we have a Bart's interview on the cards. So you dress up smart looking and feeling confident, and you head over to East London. You're staying present. You're not worrying about how things are gonna go. You're not casting your mind forward. You're just staying in the present because that is where your best performance is gonna come from. Because the goal of the interview is for you to go in there and show the best 
best, most confident, most engaged version of yourself. So Bart's like to call their graduate medicine interview an assessment center, um, as if I'm going over to Bain to interview for you know a management consultancy position. But still, classically, it was a two-part interview where the first bit of it was um, a panel-style uh, thing where you sat in front of two interviewers and they just grill you or ask you a certain set of questions. And then the second part was a group task. And this is essentially where you're asked to get into a group of people um, that you're directly competing with for spots. And then you're made to do a little task together and they see how well you work within the team. For a panel interview, it's always wise to read over your personal statement and be solid on all the stories that you put down in that. And for a group task, it's sensible to try and learn people's names early. You know, try and get a role early within the group or even be involved um, with the leadership group that is assigning people roles. Obviously, don't be silent and fade into the background but equally don't be overbearing you undercook fish believe it or not jail you overcook chicken also jail undercook over yeah it's obviously cringy but you just need to try and feign the fact that you're present and engaged um, you're interested in the task and a good thing to be aware of is if you notice that someone's being timid or not getting involved just try and bring them in a little bit that shows that you're empathetic and you're, you're a real team player so it's a difficult balance to strike and it does take a bit of practice I am currently trying to take on some clients and, and to help people with some mentoring for their 2024 applications so if you would like this uh, you, if you would like my input um, and my feedback then please send me an email Although Bart's wouldn't tell us the spread of degree titles for the successful cohort last year, for some reason they're really transparent about their interview marking scheme and really this is the only graduate medical school I've researched that released their interview marking pro forma. So I actually think this is a really nice touch from Bart's. I think generally medical schools should just move away from cloaking their sort of entrance statistics and their actual entry requirements in ambiguity and vague statements. I think you don't want to give people false hope and you want to give people a realistic look at whether or not they'll get into a medical school. So this is the actual mark scheme they give. Potentially interpreting this could give us um, the ability to do some targeted preparation for our interview day at Bart's. So the first thing is there's an ethical scenario. So I didn't interview at Bart's, so just speaking completely generally here. So ethical scenarios could be, for example, role plays where they test your ability to demonstrate certain um, qualities like compassion through a scenario where you're sort of a healthcare professional um, and you have a worried patient or something like that. It could also test your sense of morality and see if that's aligned with um, life as a doctor. For instance, whether you understand the boundaries of confidentiality or something. But the thing to be aware of is the fact that there will be some kind of ethical station. Point number two is qualities of a doctor. So these are things like communication, integrity, leadership, and resilience. Feasibly, they could be you know direct questions about times that you've either observed that in, in practice or a time that you've demonstrated it yourself. Could also just be um, general impressions that the interviewers get in the panel interview after spending sort of 20 minutes with you. You know, their general impression of your communication skills, your empathy, etc. So this is obviously a bit more difficult to prepare for. You can't really change who you are as a person. You just have to try and be present on the day. So I've put about 25 hours into a little ebook, and this is to try and help you a lot for your 2024 applications, create sort of compelling stories um, around these personal trait style questions. So in the book, I offer my reflections on the eight key personality traits, and I go through a template to create your own and obviously give you a worked example of that based on my own experiences. So it's available in the link below if you fancy I honestly think it would have been really helpful when I was applying. So the third and last scoring domain is our university and course. So this could be specific knowledge about the course, which hopefully I've given you some idea of in this video. So what sounds specifically good about Bart's graduate medicine? Um, as I said, the PBL elements of it, the academic makeup of your colleagues, you know, the hospitals they're affiliated with and what goes on in them and the different bits of research that are going on in the medical school. In terms of decision making after your interview, this request reveals that only interview performance will determine which candidates are made offers at this stage. So this contradicts a little bit what they say on their website, but I think what we can infer is the fact that it's all up to us. Um, we just need to perform well and we'll get an offer off the back of it. Probably no longer looking at our academic credentials and ranking us again on the basis of some kind of combined total score. So in conclusion, Bart's run a kind of small to medium sized graduate program. It's a PBL first year before you're reintroduced to undergrad in its year three. 
You really need a first, but if you have a 2.1 and a 3000 plus UCAT, you might be lucky and the SJT doesn't matter. Any degree is probably calm, but make sure you check your damn A-levels. The assessment center is a panel interview followed by a group task. Remember, once you get to interview, you're in business. 117 people interviewed last year and they gave around 50 offers, so that's around you know, just over a one in two chance of getting in. That is it, I hope it was useful in some way. It was probably unbelievably long because it took me ages to film for some reason. But yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.